In this video, we're going to take a deeper look at the Maxwell relation derived from the Helmholtz energy so that we can begin to understand uh, the usefulness of Maxwell relations. Right, in the prior video, we have seen uh, that you can derive this Maxwell relation from the fundamental equation of the Helmholtz energy. And again, uh, until now, uh, uh, it's not obvious what these things mean at all or what are their use, right? So the, der the derivations are what they are, and um, some people might be a little overwhelmed by uh, uh, the implication of, of these equations. So again, we're going to take here a few minutes to try to see uh, how useful these things are. Right, when we, uh, let, me, let me actually write that uh, uh, Maxwell relation here on top so that we can have a, a closer look at it and begin to uh, think about it. All right, great. So, uh, for example, this one, right? So what you have here is how the entropy changes with volume isothermally, right? So you can imagine maybe that you have a gas inside a cylinder, and now you that gas is going to undergo a gas expansion, isothermal gas expansion, right? So uh, the idea then is to see if we can actually uh, get an, an expression for how that entropy is changing with volume. Uh, what we know is that, is, the, is, that, is that if you actually increase the volume for that gas, then the entropy is going to increase. You increase the number of microstates, and then the entropy should increase, right? So uh, that's what, what this allows you to calculate. But it turns out that that is related to uh, the first derivative of the, of the pressure with respect to temperature at constant volume, right? So that is how the pressure uh, would increase or decrease when you uh, change the temperature uh, isometrically at constant volume, right? So those things, again, nobody would ever think that those things should be connected, but it, they really are. Right? As a matter of fact, what we can do here is take a closer look at this part of the Maxwell relation, and we're going to code it as a function of experimental observables. These are uh, properties that we can actually measure in the lab and we have, we have numbers for them, for them. All right, so let's see how that works out. Notice that what we have right here is the first derivative of the pressure with respect to temperature at constant volume. And uh, we have very similar expressions, uh, but not quite this one, for other properties that we have studied. For example, uh, you might remember that we have studied this first derivative, right? So the volume with respect to temperature at a constant pressure Okay. This is what we call, this was related to, uh, uh, to the expansion coefficient alpha, okay. and the relation was actually 1 over the volume, the first derivative of the volume with respect to temperature, constant pressure, that was expansion coefficient, right? So, so that is how uh, materials or, or substances expand when you increase the temperature, right? So that's something that we know, this is something that you can measure. Uh, this, uh, this is not quite that one, but it seems to be quite close. Notice that you have the th same three variables, they're just uh, uh, poised differently. At the same time, we also have studied the following one, right? So the way that the volume changes with pressure at constant temperature, right? That is related to something that we defined as kappa uh, of T, which was the compressibility. And the exact definition was minus 1 over V, partial derivative of volume with respect to pressure, constant temperature, that is the compressibility, right? So that is uh, how much does the volume change when you apply pressure to a material. Again, those are things we have tables for these numbers for pure substances, which are easy to get. Uh, and again, this is very close to that one, but not quite. You have the, uh, uh, also the same three variables, but it's not quite what we want. So questions whether we can actually uh, have this uh, expression that we have right here put as a function of these two, which are known. And yes, we can do that uh, using the Euler chain rule of first derivatives, right? So you get the three variables, which are these ones, and relate it by an Euler chain rule, which we're going to do uh, right away, right? So what that means is uh, that Euler chain rule is going to be like this, so, uh, sorry, temperature, respect to volume at constant pressure, and finally uh, the first derivative of the volume with respect to pressure at constant temperature, this is equal to minus one, right? So that is your Euler chain rule. Chain rule. 
okay, of first derivatives. Only great to note is that uh, this is nice because what we uh, are going to do is then take this first derivative, which is what we have in our Maxwell relation, and we're going to be able to relate it to first derivatives that are known. As a matter of fact, notice that this one uh, is actually related to our isothermal compressibility. And this one is not quite our expansion coefficient, it's just reversed, right? So we can actually uh, also use another trick, which is the reciprocal rule, to, to actually hack into that as well. Right, so let's, let's go uh, step by step. First, we're going to solve for the partial derivative of interest, which is this one again. That's the one you have in the Maxwell relation. And then that is going to be equal to minus 1 over the other 2. Partial derivative of t, we'll just stick to the v, constant pressure, and then volume with respect to pressure, uh, constant temperature. Great. Okay, uh, so this one, again, that's very uh, close to what we have uh, here for uh, the expansion coefficient, but it's reverse, right? So what we can actually do is apply the reciprocal rule, bring it to the uh, numerator, but uh, reversed, right? So that is going to be partial of v with respect to partial of t at constant pressure. All right, great. And then we're actually then uh, ready to solve for this uh, for these two partial derivatives, which again are related to our ice, uh, expansion coefficient and isothermal compressibility. So, matter of fact, notice that this we can do as follows, right? And then this turns into the following, minus kappa t times v. All right, so uh, I can write that here as minus. In the numerator, we're going to have expansion coefficient times the volume. In the denominator, we're going to have minus isothermal compressibility times the volume. But of course, the minus signs uh, cancel out. And the volumes also cancel out. So notice how simple this turns out to be. Okay, so the first derivative of the pressure with respect to temperature at constant volume is the ratio of two observable uh, properties, right? So this is the uh, expansion coefficient and that is the isothermal compressibility. And these are numbers that we actually know. Right? So if you know these numbers for a pure substance, say like graphite or CO2 uh, or, or any substance that you want, then what it means is that you know this first derivative and that also tells you the variation of the entropy of a substance as you change the volume uh, of that substance isothermally, right? So, so hopefully this illustrates the usefulness of, of these Maxwell relations in which, again, something that is not obvious of, of how to calculate, right? That the way that the entropy changes with volume isothermally, now it turns out to be something that is very simple. Yes, the ratio of this an expansion coefficient over the isothermal compressibility. As a matter of fact, I'm going to write a yes right here, all right, so that we can uh, uh, make that further connection uh, right there. Okay, very good. So uh, this uh, is, has been kind of an addendum to the Maxwell relation for the Helmholtz energy, uh, where we have begun to see the usefulness of these Maxwell relations. Uh, in the next video, we're going to go to the uh, Maxwell relation uh, that we're going to obtain from the Gibbs energy.